Uh, well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this evening's uh, event. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Charlie Bean, Professor of Economics here at LSE, although previously Deputy Governor at the Bank of England, uh, in which capacity I came to know tonight's speaker, Jaime Caruana, uh, well. Uh, Jaime has been the General Manager of the Bank for International Settlements since April 2009. Uh, before that, he was financial counsellor to the managing director and director of monetary and capital markets department at the International Monetary Fund. Uh, from 2000 to 2006, he was governor of the Banco de España, that's uh, Spain's central bank, for those of you who don't know. Uh, and in that, that capacity, he also served on the governing council of the European Central Bank. Uh, he was chairman of the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision from 2003 to 2006 and has been a member of the Financial Stability Board since uh, 2003. Uh, before he went to the Bank of Spain, uh, Jaime had a long career uh, in the private sector in uh, the financial side. Uh, finally, I think it's worth mentioning that he's a member of the Group of 30 which is a select group of eminent policymakers, financiers, and academics whose purpose is to deepen understanding of major economic and financial issues. Uh, well, his talk tonight, uh, as you can see, is entitled Credit, Commodities, and Currencies, uh, and it analyzes the forces underlying three major contemporary economic developments, uh, slowing growth, especially in emerging economies, uh, as credit cycles uh, mature, uh, large movements in exchange rates, uh, again often afflicting uh, the emerging economies, uh, and finally falls in commodity prices, especially that of oil, uh, which has been accompanied by more general financial turbulence in recent months. Uh, and at the conclusion of his talk, he's going to draw out some of the implications of these events for policymakers. Uh, for any Twitter users in the audience, uh, the hashtag for today's event uh, is uh, hash LSERC. It's on the bottom of the slide here. Uh, can I also ask you please to put your phones on silent uh, so as not to disrupt the event. Uh, this evening's event is being recorded uh, and will hopefully be made available as a podcast, subject to there being no technical problems. And finally, uh, in the unlikely event of a fire alarm, since we're not intending to have a test at this time of day, if it, one does go off, you know it's the real thing, uh, and the assembly point is outside Tower 1. Uh, as usual, after the lecture, there'll be a chance for you to put your questions to the speaker. Uh, but now, will you please uh, welcome uh, Mr. Caruana to LSE to deliver his lecture entitled Credit, Commodities, and Currencies. Thank you. Well, um, thank you. Thank you very much for this introduction. It's really for me a pleasure, an honor, and also a challenge uh, to be here. I think I was here in this same room uh, 10 years ago, uh, 11. Uh, I was here talking about uh, banking regulation. So if any was here at that time, please forget what I may have said at that point of time. World has changed enormously. And uh, I am here today to talk about a completely uh, different topic, but uh, even if it is completely different, it is very much related. And part of what I'm going to say is that we need to look more and more into the interrelationships, and we need to look more and more into what it is going on as a kind of movie that has started probably well before even uh, uh, the crisis. Uh, many things have changed, as I was saying, but uh, one thing has not changed, and it is that uh, LSE is at the forefront of economic debates. And again, I remember very well some of the debates that I had at that point of time, and I am looking forward for, for today's uh, discussion. So a few um, 
days ago in, the, in our uh, quarterly review uh, of the BIS, we were talking about uh, an easy calm in, uh, in markets, and certainly this easy calm uh, gave way to a turbulent start uh, this year. Um, we are not uh, really following the day-to-day -day ups and downs on markets. I don't think that this is what we uh, would, li would like to do. Um, but if I had to um, summarize some of the developments that are happening today, and I'm sure that you can organize that in many ways, but let's say that we organize around three themes that I have presented here. Disappointing growth, meaning we continually revise uh, uh, the, the growth that is expected a little bit down. Next year it will be higher than this year, but it will be less higher than it was expected a few months ago. And now the, at the center stage is the emerging economies uh, that are uh, driving this uh, uh, revision. Then we have seen also large shifts in exchange rates, uh, particularly between emerging markets against the dollar. And obviously we have seen a sharp fall uh, in, uh, in commodity prices. That has hit enormously as insignificantly the commodity exporters, but it is also as a positive side is providing a positive uh, dividend, growth dividend, to other uh, countries. Now, I would like to uh, think uh, and to uh, say that sometimes when we discuss these themes and we read about these themes, it is, these are characterized uh, or presented sometimes as a kind of exogenous th shocks uh, and non-related shocks. Um, and what I would like to propose today um, is that Perhaps it's much better to think, to take a very long-term perspective, and when you take a long-term perspective, many of the different shocks seem to be part, again, of the same movie. They have some common elements, and uh, these elements are important to understand uh, what it is happening, and more importantly, to think about uh, future uh, positive, uh, pos pos possible uh, developments. There is more endogeneity in, in some of these phenomena that uh, normally we, we, we think, and this is, what we, this is why we talk about a, a, long, a, long, a long movie. And one of the things that becomes more evident is the important role that uh, in this movie is the uh, stocks. So uh, one way of, uh, one alternative title to this conference could have been is the stocks, not the shocks. So not necessarily is shocks, if we look at the stocks, perhaps we could see some of the interrelationship. And what I am going to uh, try today is to uh, take some of the relationships, some of these interrelationships where the uh, stocks are important. And, um, and I think when we take this long-term perspective, we can see slow-moving phenomena that perhaps we are not paying too much attention uh, within the normally policy framework and we need to pay more attention to that, and one of them is the accumulation of uh, stocks and the accumulation of uh, some imbalances, and, and others, I, I would say. And one of example, and one example that I'm, talking, I'm going to talk about is debt, and uh, I will talk about debt. I will talk also about the assets on the other side of the debt, obviously, and uh, I would like to uh, relate this with some of the issues about emerging markets, about commodities, and about uh, currencies. And although I am going to concentrate more on emerging markets, because this seems to be one uh, of the important elements today, I would like to say that we could do similar analysis in relation to advanced economies, and some of the fragilities also will be in, uh, um, not exactly the same, but a different ones, but also looking at the stocks, we will look at fragilities in advanced uh, economies. Now, there is a, a, a positive uh, element uh, and a positive message coming out of this analysis is that um, some of the movements that we have seen, some of the realignments, adjustments, whatever is the name you want to use, may bring some, some short-term discomfort. We have seen this at the beginning of the year, but to the extent uh, that this is indicating adjustment of the real economy, um, that is necessary, uh, some normalization of the uh, real economy that, uh, of the economy that is necessary, this will eventually allow, uh, allow some renewed uh, growth. So what I am going to do today is first 
uh, an overview of some of the stocks, particularly on debt, on some elements, and particularly um, I will be talking about debt in emerging economies, um, relationship with financial developments. I will talk a little bit uh, some of the indicators that we publish in what we call the, the global liquidity indicators that we publish twice a year at the BIS, and I will concentrate a little bit on the dollar-denominated debt, which is an important part of some of the dynamics that we are seeing now. Afterwards, I will try to make things more confusing, connecting uh, the dots between these recent developments, uh, debt and exchange rate, exchange rate and sovereign risk, debt and oil. And finally, I will try to draw some implications and, and, uh, and, and some policy conclusion, uh, conclusions. This is going to be a very stylized, and when I say stylized, I mean oversimplified uh, kind of analysis. Uh, behind some of the charts and some of the analysis, there are some research that uh, some people at the BIS have done, and most of it is published, and you can, if you want to deepen on some of these things, uh, Hewn is one of the ones that has contributed to many of these pieces, but there are quite a, a number of research, a number of papers that have been published and can be consulted. So let me go to the first real uh, chart in content, and here I am presenting the private, private credit in emerging markets and advanced economies. Um, I would like to say that, uh, uh, first of all, debt has increased dramatically since the crisis all over the place when you look at uh, overall figures. There are exceptions. You can look at uh, private debt in the UK. This has been decreasing. It has been decreasing in the United States. It has been decreasing in Spain, in some of the countries that were hit, uh, where private debt has come down significantly. Uh, but uh, overall, when you add up uh, private debt and uh, public debt, you will see a significant increase. Public debt, basically, in advanced economies, private debt, basically in emerging market economies. And I'm here concentrated on private debt. And you can see here that from 2009 to uh, the present uh, situation on the left uh, panel, you can see that the, the non-financial private sector debt has increased by 50 points. And uh, wh while, as I said, in the advanced economies, basically is a, a slightly decline or horizontal line. Now, these lines are misleading in the sense that if you would uh, uh, look into it, into details, you will find countries that have grown significantly uh, the debt and countries that have. So it's a very wide range of, uh, uh, of uh, situations. Uh, if you look, for example, at the G20, two countries have decreased private debt more than 20 percentage points of GDP, and seven have increased more than 20 percent of GDP their debt. So it's a wide range. Now, two cases that I have put before anyone asks uh, uh, that are always in the press, China and Brazil, two rapid growing uh, private debt. And perhaps uh, the substance is on the non-financial corporate debt, the right one, where you can see that the growth has been very rapid and that the growth uh, uh, in emerging markets, corporations have been issuing significant amount of debt to the point that have even increased uh, above, is now above the level of the uh, mature uh, economies. Now, what, what are the assets uh, on the other side that are financed with this uh, rapid uh, debt? There has been an analysis uh, on uh, about 280 emerging market companies that have issued bonds in international markets. Uh, and and uh, these um, companies have been analyzed in terms of their balance sheet to see uh, the, what are the assets, what have been the investment that has been done with, with uh, debt. And you can see that the leverage, uh, first of all, that the leverage has increased. And importantly, if you look at the um, main, at the center uh, panel, you can see that the non-tradable sectors, in fact, has the, the debt has increased even, the leverage has increased even larger. So it's not only uh, what you could think it is commodity producers that have indebted, it's also uh, 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 companies that are working in non-tradable sectors that have increased significantly the leverage. And on the right side, you can see what has happened in terms of profitability. Profitability has come down. This is indicating one of the messages that is some of these uh, 
credit cycles are maturing in emerging markets, and this is part of what it is happening. And we can see that profitability of those, of those investments have come down, and it is now even lower, having been ab above advanced economies, now have come lower uh, than it is in the, in the um, uh, advanced economies. Now again, should we be, uh, or how much uh, should we be concerned about that? Uh, we all know that debt is, uh, uh, some debt is helpful. It uh, helps to smooth consumption. It helps to offset uh, demand shocks uh, by reallocating spending over time. It helps and allows firms to invest faster than their cash flow, so it's a, it's a positive thing. But at the same time, uh, in this crisis, uh, if we are talking about investment, we have not seen that much real investment in the world. So what is happening? And uh, that's one question. And the other thing is that when you analyze this crisis or you analyze this stress in markets, you see that one of the good indicators ex ante of what is going to happen is credit growth. So these two things make you ask again uh, whether uh, should we concern or should not we concern. And I am going to uh, ask uh, to say three reasons why at least we should not be complacent, which is something that we at Central Banking would like to say <coughs> and repeat, not to be complacent. Okay, we should not be complacent for three reasons. First, because borrowing adds to the stock of debt, and again, stocks matter, and when the stocks get to some level, there are some um, uh, indications, some empirical evidence that it can act as a, as a drag uh, to growth. And to the empirical evidence that have been analyzing this, we have added recently another piece of research at the BIS that indicates a relationship between the credit booms and productivity growth. And we have seen that uh, productivity growth is damaged by credit booms. And importantly, before, during the credit booms, and importantly, after the credit booms, and for some time. And this credit growth is, is, uh, is uh, the productivity growth is reduced um, for, uh, in relation to a non-boom um, situation. And perhaps the, the channel is misallocation of resources. Resources are allocated to sectors that have lower productivity, and the result is lower productivity uh, in the economy. And you may say, okay, well, that's not that new, true, there are misallocation in credit booms, but when we have tried to measure that, the amount of reduction of productivity growth is quite significant. And I would leave you to look into a paper that was published in, uh, in January. This is not today's uh, topic. But my second uh, point, why we should be at least not complacent, is because, uh, because of the link between debt and risk taking. And this can do, uh, can change and turn the financial cycle quite uh, rapidly, quite abruptly. Um, in the booms, I think investors f uh, get a false sense of security, but when assets, when the cycle matures and assets start to fall, then uh, debt becomes less sustainable. Everything becomes much more, more rapid and you can uh, accelerate the deleveraging and capital outflows. And my third reason is um, one of the uh, components of this borrowing which is borrowing in dollars. And the fact is that during this period of time, debt was increasing, but it, one particular segment was debt in dollars uh, that was increasing. And this is one of our preferred charts at the BIS. Uh, it, and we are following this figure. On the, or on the world is the debt in dollars hold by non-residents in the United States. So it's someone that has issued dollars but it is not resident in the United States. And the figure has increased rapidly and now is <coughs> $9.8 trillion. And one of the things that we have seen is that it has been continuously growing except last quarter, which has stabilized and that could be indicating that there is some uh, tightening on the financial conditions looking at this stock that started to, to, to peak. And, and, um, and, and this creation of dollars and dollar debt, dollar liabilities doesn't need to come from the United States. And in fact, some of them, it comes from banks that are not uh, in the United States. So this is a dollar debt, not necessarily uh, by uh, American banks. Now, what is the part of emerging market? 
the part of emerging market is 3.3 trillion dollars. And here what we are adding up, in both cases, what we are adding up is uh, household, is private corporations and sovereigns. There is no banks, there is no uh, included in this, in this uh, uh, Now, I was saying that some of the figures are starting to peak. Some of the figures are starting that, uh, that could indicate that financial conditions are tightening. You can see financial conditions tightening in terms of quantities more clearly in the US dollar cross-border, banking cross-border claims. And you can see that if you take some of the uh, uh, economies, you can see that the amounts outstanding are starting to decline. This is another indication of, of some tightening. tightening can be in two ways. One is the dollar as moving up, but the other way is in the quantities, and you can see that also uh, in the uh, here in this quantity. Now, this is just a chart to show you uh, that uh, you took look not at the dollar debt outside of the United States, but just total dollar debt. That would be the first chart on the left. You can see the brown or yellow uh, part. This is in the United States, so it's uh, dollar debt in United States, and the other two segments are the, the 9.8 that I was mentioning. So it's a small part, but it's a growing and a significant part in any case. And perhaps the most interesting part is on the right side, which is the rate of growth. And you can see that consistently since the crisis, at least the debt securities issued by not residents in dollars have been much higher than the credit to residents in dollars in the United States. Same pol monetary policy having more effects outside of the country that than inside uh, of, uh, uh, of the country. Now, what is the use of these assets, uh, of these uh, dollars that they, have, um, that they have issued, these corporations? One thing that they can do is obvious, they need to buy some other foreign assets that would be normal, you issue dollars, you buy some company or whatever. But this is not the only reason. In fact, there has been a lot of, um, a dollar issued uh, that has been financing uh, investments, investing in their own in their own countries in a different currency. If it is uh, a company that, uh, for example, produces oil, there is some uh, partial edge or some edge because they are going to get uh, revenues in dollars. But this is not necessarily always uh, the case. And in addition, uh, that we have seen that. Um, Part of the dollars that have been issued have been um, deposited, have been used to invest in financial assets. For example, they issue dollars and part of it they deposit as a deposit in their own currency in their own country. Or they buy a liability of a shadow bank, a uh, short-term liability of a shadow bank, which means is, uh, is some kind of carry trade what it is carried in a bank, but not done by banks, is done by commercial companies, by, by, by industrial companies, that perhaps they are waiting for investment in the future. There may be other reasons, but uh, this is what happened. Now, the point is that when situations reverse and the dollar exchange rate moves or interest rate moves, they will have the same incentives that the carriage is to unwind, and this would affect also financial conditions in the uh, in their own in their own countries. So we have looked so far to the stocks, emerging markets, dollar debt, and I would like now to start to try to connect some of the uh, dots, connect uh, the dollar debt with uh, the weakness, uh, with the, the dollar debt with uh, movements in the exchange rates. So this um, chart shows the strong link between dollar strength and weakness and emerging market borrowing. You can see on the right side just a description of the evolution of the, of the dollar in nominal effective rates. And you can see the uh, weakening of the dollar and then lately the rapid uh, move up um, uh, strengthening of the dollar. I think the, uh, in, the in the uh, two other panels, what we show is the relationship of uh, whether the dollar is moving up or moving down with the flows to emerging uh, markets. And as the uh, dollar uh, weakens, 
it, en it encourages borrowing in dollars. And there are, as a consequence, a stronger flows into emerging uh, markets. If you look at the uh, central panel, the, sh the shaded uh, um, uh, bands is the quarters where there has been some depreciation and it is when the flows are larger and the opposite happens in the other, uh, uh, in the other quarters. So uh, what it says is when the dollar is weakening, this is leading to a rapid rise in dollar debt and, um, uh, and when the dollar starts to strengthen, as it is the present situation, because there, are, there is a shift in US monetary policy uh, and an expectation of that, there is a reaction in terms of markets and in terms of risk taking that changes significantly the flows, changes significantly the conditions in uh, emerging markets. So, and uh, these uh, amplification mechanisms that amplifies the deleveraging, it uh, is very risk sensitive in the sense that the small movements can uh, move rapidly this, this kind of uh, flows. Um, there are mitigants, and I think it would be important to mention that there are significant mitigants to these mechanisms, um, mitigants of these concerns. One of them is that many firms that have issued this dollar, um, have dollar cash flows, as I mentioned, uh, and therefore they are able to manage the, uh, the dollars that they, uh, they have in their balance sheet as a liability with this serv to service the debt because they have inflows. There is another one, which is that some of the dollars that have been issued, the debt that has been issued is long-term debt, and in fact is improving their they may have improved in the, the, the structure, they issued long-term debt, and perhaps they are replacing some of the short-term debt that they have with banks. So there is some elements, but of course we have seen that the debt has increased, so uh, this is only part of it. But they have long-term maturities, that's uh, a positive and a mitigant effect, and most importantly, emerging markets do hold today a significant amount of additional reserves and that is also a significant uh, caution. But our point is that, yes, there are mitigants, but we should not underestimate the feedback loop between the deleveraging, this risk-taking working in reverse, this deleveraging in emerging markets when, uh, uh, when their domestic currency is uh, depreciating. First, because um, there may be this carry trace that I was mentioning before that will affect, uh, ex accelerate exchange rates and will affect tightening uh, financial conditions uh, in the country. And uh, also, even if there is no distress in terms of servicing the debt, what it will may happen is that these companies are under pressure and they will invest less, they will hire less, and they will affect the economy, the broader economy. And that will be another uh, feedback. And then there is an additional uh, effect that is that uh, um, depreciation of emerging currencies has an effect on sovereign credit worthiness and this chart shows that and uh, uh, shows the two dimensions one is the cross uh, country dimension and the other one is the evolution you can see uh, first in terms of time evolution uh, how as the dollar has been strengthening the different countries, each country is represented there uh, and uh, this, uh, the amount of the circumference is, is really the debt, that they, the private debt. Uh, everything has moved as the dollar moves, the CDS, that is a measure of the risk of the sovereign, has started to increase. And that's the time dimension. There is also a cross dimension among countries and you can see that they create a line. The more they have the value, the more has increased the sovereign risk represented by the, the CDS. This is another kind of, uh, of, uh, of relationship. And if, although most of the countries that are represented here uh, are oil producers, the truth is that in the paper that was uh, published and that uh, is uh, it's at your disposal, 
this mechanism is also working for those that are importing, which is an, an, an interesting. And it affects not only the uh, CDS, but also Fred affects the uh, spreads, uh, which is another uh, measure. Now, um, part of the explanation has to do with, uh, with uh, oil prices uh, and the relationship between debt and oil prices, and this is going to be uh, my last uh, kind of trying to connect it points um, uh, out the dots. There is a big impact on commodity, commodity prices fall, but this is not only for emerging markets, it's also obvious for U.S. shale producers. For example, it is related more to the uh, fact that some of these companies are highly uh, leveraged. So the common element is the leverage, is the stock of debt of these uh, companies. And uh, I think there was a very interesting article of Spencer Dale recently uh, saying that uh, there is a debt-driven model for the oil sector uh, in, uh, and, that, uh, and that he was talking about the new credit channel in, in, the oil, in, in the oil market. Of course, the oil is a very uh, complicated market and, and we are not uh, trying to explain what is happening in the oil market. We are just trying to say that perhaps part of the dynamics that we see could be uh, as an additional effect, as an additional amplifier mechanism, be explained by the relationship of the oil prices and uh, debt in the, in, the, in, uh, in the following way. We've seen how these oil firms have uh, borrowed significantly. They have borrowed in uh, uh, a significant amount. Here you have the figures. I will not get into detail. I mean, I think I will move a little bit faster. We can go back to that. But really the main message is they have increased their, their, their leverage, in part because they can borrow a lot, in part because they have assets, which is the uh, oil reserves, and against that they have been able to, uh, uh, to lever. Of course, when the price of oil starts to, uh, to come down, the uh, situation starts to be a little bit more, uh, more complicated. And I think uh, you can see that uh, uh, in this chart, particularly just look at the, at the, at the right part. Um, when uh, the oil starts to come down, you can see a number uh, of, uh, of effects. You can see that, um, that uh, the in there is a significant increase in the cost of uh, borrowing, the cost of this debt and uh, this is hurting a number of things. We already mentioned that it is hurting their capacity to invest, their capacity to hire, but some of these companies, particularly in, in emerging markets, are um, um, public companies, and their revenues, their dividends to their budget are a significant part of the budget. And when you get these less revenues, what you are hitting also is the capacity of the budgets to manage this kind of situation. And in fact, some of the emerging markets have been hedging and have been adjusting their budget significantly. But even those that have been hedging, the hedging normally is short term and they have to, uh, uh, to uh, adjust and to, and to uh, cut back some of the investing. So, I've tried to, I've tried to show um, some of the relationship. I've tried to explain uh, our view, which is that we need to take a, a long-term uh, perspective. And uh, by taking a long-term perspective, um, we can explain some of the mechanisms, some of the um, characteristics of the, of the economy. It is already eight years since the crisis, and it is fine, it, the economy has found it extremely difficult to, to get to a sustainable and balanced uh, growth. And again, recovery has been extremely uh, modest. Uh, this episode is emerging markets for a number of reasons, with all the adjustment that I have mentioned and all these interrelations that uh, I have mentioned. But again, this is uh, a part of a, a long movie and during this time, uh, stocks have been building up and it is becoming more difficult to manage 
uh, these uh, long, uh, long stops and to manage ma when the situation reaches the point in which the cycles uh, start uh, to mature. Again, um, to the extent that these transformations and realignments help to correct these imbalances and to slow down this uh, debt, um, I think this is uh, a, a welcome path to, towards uh, normalization. But we have learned that these processes are not uh, smooth and not uh, linear, pose significant challenges. Um, and these challenges uh, can be managed and hopefully we are wiser in terms of managing that because we have had a, a lot uh, of experience on that. But we may be tempted to think that the, the, the trick is to continue to keep financial booms going and I, we don't think that this is the case. This would be really palliatives and not trying to uh, solve uh, uh, the, the, the real underlying problems. And um, we hopefully think that we are again better prepared, uh, but the challenges are we know that the challenges of maturing cycles are uh, difficult. And um, this takes me to my last two remarks uh, that is uh, more related to uh, policy that we have been, um, uh, policy prescription that we have been saying at the BIS and that probably I am doing a key a little bit of a jump and I am getting a little bit of more uh, altitude in, the, in, this, in these two uh, conclusions. And the first one would be that we need to uh, a more balanced combination of policies, that monetary policy that sets to some extent the price of uh, leveraging has been overburdened for, uh, for too long, that monetary policy has been used in an uh, asymmetric way through different financial cycles, and uh, we need to pay much more attention to the impediments to growth that are not necessarily solved by monetary policy, and we need to pay uh, more attention to this slow-moving um, building up of imbalances, building up of debt um, that at the end are difficult to manage. Um, we have seen bumpiness, and bumpiness is something that probably we are going to see. It is more bumpy when you have significant stocks of debt, uh, and we have more debt, so there will be some bumpiness. Bumpiness is going to be expected and should not be a reason to delay the process of normalization that at the end it has to, uh, to happen. And that's one of our uh, conclusions that we have been saying for some time. There is a second kind of uh, conclusion that we have been um, mentioning, and it is the need to recognize and internalize something that I have been talking about, which is the importance of spillovers and spillbacks, spillovers from monetary policy to the global condition, from global conditions to the uh, different policies of different countries uh, that contribute to some of the cycles that we have seen, and this at some point of time spill, spill back to the world economy. The principle of keeping house in order is a very sound principle and it's absolutely necessary. You have, to house, you have to have your house in order, but we think that in this world this is uh, not enough and uh, if we want to make sure that we don't repeat the same kind of processes and it seems that we have very serious difficulty to start to grow without being uh, fueled by credit. This is something that uh, it's difficult. Um, and we should be looking at other issues such as productivity growth, etc. But again, if we want not to repeat this kind of issues, it is important that in addition to keep your house in order, uh, uh, policymakers uh, do also look to keep the neighborhood uh, in order. And in that sense, uh, cooperation and central bank cooperation, it will be important uh, and very important. I will stop here. Uh, what I would like to say is that uh, I've mentioned some of our views, some of our views that uh, we are still investigating, that we are still researching, and uh, we will need all the help of uh, an institution such as the U and the LSE to confirm, to uh, go against, or uh, to see what are 
uh, really the mechanisms that are driving some of the forces that uh, we are seeing in the, in the global economy. Uh, but financial cycles, spillovers, these are areas, and stocks, these are areas that we need to understand much better than in the past. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Jaime. The floor is now open for uh, questions. Uh, if you can wait till you get the mic, uh, and when you get the mic, please say your name and affiliation and try to keep your question reasonably short and precise rather than giving a speech of your own. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, I'm Dan Hinge from Central Banking. Um, I wondered if you've spoken mostly about um, US dollar denominated funding um, this evening, but I wondered if you've seen similar patterns in other currencies, so perhaps a shift from you know, US dollar funding to euro funding or something similar. Yes, uh, and we publish that figures too. Uh, however, these are significantly lower both in absolute terms and in uh, relative terms. So I don't remember the figures, but they are, um, I mean, you have it because we published that, uh, it don't, but it's significantly lower. And uh, perhaps now um, it would be becoming more important, uh, funding in euros, that may be a trend that could start now. But uh, so far uh, we have seen some, but uh, not as significant uh, and certainly not so important in the dynamics that we are seeing today. Um, <coughs> my name is Rupert Goodwin. Uh, the question I have is, are you concerned about any change in the level of debt and the change in the speed or otherwise of population size? So do you see any relationship between the change in population sizes in these different regions and the uh, amount of debt that they're carrying? Well, that's, uh, uh, I'm not sure how to answer that question, frankly speaking. I think we are looking at uh, debt from the perspective of financial stability. And from that uh, perspective, I think the important uh, elements that we have uh, covered is uh, this relationship with the assets that they have on the other side and the dynamics uh, with exchange rates, et cetera. Of course, uh, I think you have a point, and it depends a lot on the dynamics of the, of the population. And uh, in any case, uh, it will be w w the data that we are using is in relation to GDP. And GDP also should be in somehow related to uh, growth of GDP, should be related to growth of, of population. Uh, I have, we have not looked at that uh, variable, and we could uh, do that to see if our conclusions uh, differ in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, when we look from that perspective. I have the impression that probably uh, not too much. Down him. Isabel Mateo Silago from BlackRock. Uh, thank you for the fascinating uh, lecture. Um, so one of the conclusions you drew was the need to recognize and internalize international spillovers and spillbacks. So considering that, what do you think the Fed should do right now, uh, given that with this overhang of dollar debt around the world, if it moves aggressively or even uh, not aggressively but steadily, this is going to have adverse impact for the rest of the world? Well, I'm very sorry, but uh, the questions that I don't answer is uh, uh, <laughs> what central banks should do. Uh, and I would say two things. One is we don't answer these questions as a matter of principle. Second, even in our analysis have a different perspective, and we are not looking in the same kind of time span that they are looking. We are looking medium term. I think this is necessary. Someone has to look at the medium term, and I think the um, central banks have to look in more short term, and therefore is a different uh, is a different perspective. But in in any case, I I will not uh, I will not answer that. <laughs> uh, down here in the front. Marcus Schüler, I represent Market. Um, Jaime, you mentioned some mitigants for the issuance of dollar-denominated debt, and you mentioned that it could be longer dated. 
or there could be a natural hedge because you have cash flows and dollars. The one potential mitigant you didn't mention was if y you might want to issue in the dollar market because it's the most liquid market and you can get big size long-term funding. But if you didn't like the currency risk, you might want you, you might have decided to hedge your dollar exposure. Do you do we have any information about to what extent this foreign dollar denominated debt has been hedged by the issuers? Yeah, I think I think what we have seen is that there is some, but uh, but uh, there is and and some of the dollar hedge are short term, and therefore they do not cover too much. And in that sense, uh, we don't think that uh, we think that the phenomenon that we are describing are at play, and 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 they are not completely uh, complete mitigants. Um, I you, I mean, uh, there are more mitigants, frankly speaking. If we were so we have mentioned a number, but you could do more than that. And for example, um, there has been some um, um, actions by central banks whereby they uh, have auctions they, that whereby they finance and provide the dollars that some of the uh, private sector is uh, needed. That's another way of, miti of mitigating some of the risk, and this has happened. Uh, but, but in any case, this is not simple. And in, uh, when the central banks are in this situation, normally they need to do that. But in addition to do that, they need to present a package of, of additional reforms in order to get um, uh, the, the market dynamics uh, in, a, in a more stable way. So I, 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 as I said at the beginning, this is a very stylized and very, um, but uh, yes, we have looked at that. I think this will help a bit, but it will not solve the, the issue. Over there, please. Over there, there was a Hi, uh, my name is Mark Boland. I'm an Africa Middle East economist at Bloomberg Intelligence. So I also have a question relating to these points with these sort of international spill <coughs> spillovers and spillbacks. I mean, there is uh, Helen Ray, who you're probably quite familiar with, you know, just touching on this area of this, you know, trillions of dollars just sloshing around the economy and very much on quite short-term horizons and the sort of topic of capital controls has come back into a sort of inter international framework, at least the discussion, and what is your sort of vision on that? Or what's your view on that? And maybe not, sort of, I'm just thinking of sterilizing to sort of avoid some of the more of the short-term money, which arguably maybe adds more volatility rather than actual lowering interest rates and supporting investment. Well, um, I think we, we, t we tend to think that, yes, there are more instruments and you have um, uh, capital controls, um, uh, capital flow management, as it's now uh, uh, said. You have macroprudential policies. You can use these policies. We tend to think that uh, capital controls or management of flows uh, is, uh, are, issue are measures that may need to be used, but most on a temporal uh, basis and uh, as a way of acting in other uh, policies so that you can correct part of the problems. But we must recognize that we live in a world in which, uh, again, a lot of stocks and therefore uh, the capacity of flows to move and uh, it may be necessary and it has become more um, acceptable to use these, these tools in some occasions. But I think when uh, someone uses these tools, have to think really how sustainable these tools can be and therefore use it as a temporary to look for deeper solutions if these are available. So I think it is not a definite answer, but I would say that uh, yes, uh, everybody agrees that this may need to be used at some point of time, but I would not uh, look at that as a definite solution for some of these, uh, for some of these flows, problems. Well, front here, uh, Jeffrey. Uh, Jeffrey, just Jeffrey. Wait for the. I wonder if you could explain a little bit more about a central bank corporation more important than ever. <laughs> what does that mean? You know, in terms of you. Well, it means. Um, it means a lot of things. It means that we, first of all, we need to recognize that some of the um, analytical framework that we have 
to analyze uh, spillovers and spillbacks is not uh, that uh, good, and probably we are underestimating some of these effects. So I would say that uh, as a first step, we all together need to um, work a little bit more in uh, some of this uh, analytical framework. Uh, it means that uh, there is a first level of cooperation, and obviously uh, we at the BIS, uh, this is uh, the main mission. Uh, we is exchanging of views, exchanging of uh, information. Um, I so that would be the first level. We would like to see another level in which if we are able to look at these new analytical frameworks in which we could be, uh, let's say, converge views and have a more clear view on how uh, um, uh, these uh, mechanisms of uh, spillovers, of uh, spillbacks could uh, work. If we would reach this second uh, stage, it would be then perhaps possible that in a self-enlightened interest, some central banks will internalize some of these uh, spillovers and uh, spillbacks. And uh, I think we would uh, need to improve, and this is not a simple, uh, it's much more easy to say that than to do that. But I, we tend to think that if we were able to improve this analytical and demonstrate and see evidently uh, what are these uh, spillovers and uh, spillbacks, probably this cooperation will be uh, simpler. Let me say what I don't think that it is cooperation. I don't think that cooperation is some institution deciding uh, on a worldwide what is going to be uh, the, policy, the monetary policy. We are not uh, thinking of this kind of thing, and we are not thinking that uh, central banks should sit together and negotiate or agree on what are going to be the measures. So this is not what we are thinking. What we are thinking is sharing information and really try to understand much better than we do at this very moment what are the spillovers and the spillbacks and internalizing this into your own decisions. And if uh, you internalize that, probably in this self-enlightened interest, you will be thinking that probably some of your measures will have effects in others and this will make it back, get back to you and perhaps this would be a better way of, uh, and, and we have seen that, uh, but, but it's a very complex, it's a very complex uh, uh, proposition, I know that. And there was one at the back there. Hello. Um, so I know that you touched a little bit about regulation and mm -hmm. as someone that works in OTC clearing, it keeps me employed. Um, so I wonder if you could speak a bit about what you think maybe the best regulation, what you've seen that's come out since the crisis that you think has been effective, and what you think might still need to be done from a regulatory perspective. Um, that's a very general question. I think the most important thing probably is you need to look at systemic risk, and I think this is what most of the regulations have tried to do. Uh, I would put a second principle that we are living in a very complex system and complex systems are difficult to manage. But one of the lessons of complex systems is that the best way to manage them is to be prepared ex ante before the dynamics start. When the dynamics start, it's very difficult to manage. So it's much better to have capital before. If you have cautions, if you have capital, you will be able to manage these complex situations. But this has to be ex ante. Uh, before the dynamics, um, it's very difficult to do it when uh, things start. So with these principles, I think um, there has been a lot of thinking about what was necessary. And frankly speaking, at this point of time, after seven years and many years of doing and changing regulation and improving the regulation, and we can go, if you want, we can go through the different uh, pieces and, and parts of this regulation. Uh, I think the, the, what we need to do now is to conclude the regulatory reform. And I think this is the objective that regulators have today. And the objective is to conclude it soon. And uh, there, there is clear, uh, clear wish to uh, conclude what it is open at this point in the table. Still, there are a number of, of uh, very important uh, elements that need to be, to be concluded. But there is not any um, appetite for um, additional um, uh, opening up additional avenues of regulation. Uh, another one at the front, and then I have a couple uh, on the other side of the aisle. Robert McRae. 
Um, you spoke of uh, a financial realignment, um, but if we've seen developed market currencies strengthen relative to emerging market currencies, this seems to suggest increased confidence in developed market e economies relative to developing market economies. So do you see this as indicating the success of the stimulative policies pursued by developed market central banks over the last six or seven years? I would see uh, that there are many mechanisms at play, as uh, we have seen. I think it is partly the expectations of the changes in uh, in uh, monetary policies and expectations about what is the situation of the different uh, uh, economies. Uh, but uh, I was trying to say that in addition to that, there are mechanisms that will amplify and it has amplified some of these effects and the leveraging sometimes amplified uh, these, these, uh, these effects. So it is difficult always to say what is the equilibrium and certainly we are not in that, uh, in that camp to define that. What we are interested is what are the dynamics that are moving this, this kind of uh, exchange rates. Uh, Elina Rybakova from uh, LSE's Institute of Global Affairs. I wanted to ask you whether um, uh, changes introduced by Dodd-Frank, in your view, made the spillover effects more pronounced than the systemic risk, or it had no unintended consequences beyond the, the improving regulation on the sell side? I think that one of the things that we, um, all regulators are doing is first, what I said before, um, we try to conclude what it is on the table. The second thing is we are trying to analyze what are the impact and what are the effects, both intended and unintended consequences. And I think the only way of doing that is uh, once you have, well, first of all, when preparing these reforms, at least I can speak for Basel, not necessarily for Dodd-Frank, but uh, um, I, I think there has been a serious, probably the, there has been a significant amount of work trying to measure what would be potential impact. So this analysis had been much better on this occasion than in, on any other occasion, in part because there was very clear consciousness that the, 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 um, that the, the growth was weak and we needed to make sure that what we were doing was positive, etc. So there was a significant amount of work trying to measure what would be the impact. But in addition, we know that uh, the only way to measure that, it will be after. And uh, I think we are all ready and we are doing analysis of what are happening, what is happening, and what is um, the unintended, unintended consequences. So I don't know what is the answer for that yet, but the, what I can say is that there will be more and more analysis. And if you follow uh, our pages, you will see um, significant uh, um, uh, reports. You can see recently two reports about market liquidity. One of the things that uh, we are all concerned to see whether market liquidity has improved and why and what is behind that. You will see several reports from us, but you can see the same published by many other central banks and many other regulators. So this is something that uh, we all know that it is important and uh, the European Banking Authority is doing a, uh, also a, a lot of analysis and, and we are all committed to have good regulation and we need to uh, see what are the intended and unintended effects. Okay, I have another one on that side of the aisle, uh, then one in the middle of the front row and then back there. Hi, uh, Gareth Peters, University College London. So thank you for a very interesting talk. So. I just tried to understand your comment there that the regulation at present is uh, somewhat maturing and converging because what I see at the moment in some of the areas of the regulation such as in Basel documents for operational risk, for banking book and for some of the exchange regulations, it seems like there's some structural, significant structural changes that are going on to do with how capital is calculated in banks. So for instance, the one that I've been looking at in, in detail is perhaps the proposed removal of AMA, for instance, in Basel regulation. Yeah. This is a significant structural change in the regulation which would influence the capital in many jurisdictions in different ways, but primarily in the US and in Europe in different ways. And to me, that doesn't seem like a convergence. So the question is, 
What's your view on that, and if you could comment on that? So, um, there has been a significant change in, in the advanced measurement approach. That's uh, clear. What, what I am not sure is why you say that there is no convergence, because this has been agreed at the level of the committee, uh, of, at the Basel Committee. So in that sense, there is convergence. It is true what you said, that this has been a significant change, and the change is that this modeling has been abandoned uh, to some extent, and that is a significant change. And the, and, uh, the question is, why? Well, because uh, we have seen that this was not working properly, and uh, this has been done after significant consultation, or at least that was the view of the, of the Basel Committee, but there is some convergence from that perspective. I'm not sure what was your point. Yeah. Frankly speaking, um, perhaps we can discuss it. I don't, I don't, I don't follow what is your argument. I would. Is it it's not a what? In U.S. I cannot answer that question. Ron Anderson from the London School of Economics. And my question would uh, would like to connect the dots between a number of the points that you've made. Uh, you've uh, said that you think that the uh, regulatory process, re-regulatory process, is uh, hopefully uh, nearing its end. Uh, part of that has involved uh, uh, much more and capital and of better quality. So a recapitalization of the banking sector has uh, yeah. been taken very seriously, as we know. Um, but you say that we are facing a, a prospect of uh, delivering uh, in uh, the emerging markets economy, and that there could be um, managing the downturn is not easy, and there could be bumps along <coughs> the way. But you started your remarks by saying that if we take a long-term view, there's some reason for optimism that there's uh, the adjustment process can be uh, um, managed. So can I infer from this that you think that the level of capital that is now in the banking system or in the pipeline uh, is sufficient to deal with the problems? Well, um, I think this is always a probability issue, but the capital has been increased significantly. And Perhaps I should have said that one of the mitigants also for emerging markets is that they have a much better capitalized uh, banking system. So in that sense, they have, they have been much better, pre they are much better prepared than they were before. And I must say that um, it's not only the regulation. These uh, emerging markets, many of the emerging markets, uh, were very well capitalized even before some of the Basel III measures were done. And they have been very capitalized because they had learned the lessons in previous crises. So I think um, um, emerging markets have, uh, for a long time, have been improving their policy framework. They have been strengthening their financial system. And I think this is another plus in terms of managing uh, this, uh, this crisis. Um, I would say, yes, not to be complacent, that is the sentence that we need to say from time to time, uh, that also the risks are changing, and we need to be aware not only of the last uh, uh, battle, but also to be aware that ch risks are changing, and we need to be thinking also not only of being prepared for the last war, but being prepared for the next one, and the next one may be more complex in other areas. So we continue to think about what is necessary, but if you are asking me, are they better capitalized? Certainly, they are better capitalized. And we all, we will be in a much worse situation had not been the capital increased significantly over this period of, of, uh, of time. So I think, um, I think this is the, uh, that's clearly my view. This uh, is a yeah, real um, positive. Steve, uh, Steve Barrow from um, <coughs> Standard Bank. Um, just going back to your presentation, what's the bigger problem? Is it the, the level of debt or the denomination of the debt? Because in relation to the first question, for instance, as you, you sort of said, dollar debt is so much greater internationally than euro debt and obviously still much greater still than 
any other currency. Would, would you feel more comfortable if there was a, a better split between, say, dollars and euros, so the world was sort of less kind of Fed-centric, less dollar-centric? And I suppose, in a sense, sort of supplementary to that is that if the, if, the, if the answer to that is yes, then what's the chances of that, given you know, what we've been through in the Eurozone in the last few years? I think the point was that uh, the important point was that uh, there was debt issues outside of the United States, and it's not a question of uh, whether it's better euros or, or, or dollars. I am not sure I understood your question, but I think the, the important point is first, the stock of debt matters and uh, total debt, uh, and uh, in euros, in euro, in dollars, or in any other currency. This matters in one way. And in addition, there are other dynamics that uh, additional to the other ones when you are borrowing in a different currency that is your currency, the currency that you have your, your structure. If you have assets in one currency and you are borrowing in a different currency, it doesn't matter. It is going to be raising a new set of additional problems that go beyond whether you are very highly indebted or not. You have other dynamics that come from exchange rate movements. I don't know if this answers your question. I, I was not sure I... Uh, I think it's not so much whether it's centric on one currency or the other, it's what are this currency doing. If the dollar is moving up and you have liabilities in dollars, you have an issue. If the dollar, if, the, if it, you are in euros, it's a different issue, it depends on, on, on that. So I am, um, again. Are there any more? Final question over there. Final question. Uh, oh. 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 Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to go back to your first slide. You, you started by saying something very interesting about how the shocks facing the system are, are not exogenous, that they're more interrelated than we realize. And maybe I'm just thick, but I don't feel like I've got a full explanation of how and why, how, I mean, why you feel that way and how that works. So if we could go back to that, I'd appreciate that. You want me the full presentation? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I think uh, what we are trying to say is that some of the phenomena that we have seen, some of this uh, situation in the, in the economy uh, is, have some common factors. And these common factors, for example, is what happened with uh, monetary conditions. Global monetary conditions are relevant for the debt, for the exchange rates, changes on that are explaining many of these things. Financial cycles is one of the things that we have been looking into explain uh, a good part of the situation in terms of why emerging markets are now weaker in terms of growth because the financial cycle has, has uh, a peak. This is related to uh, uh, global financial conditions. Global con financial conditions are related to monetary conditions, particularly of, uh, of uh, uh, advanced economies. So there, you need to look at all these factors, and there are some, some common factors that you could look to these common factors even before the crisis, and you could explain many of the things, uh, many of the stories uh, by looking at that. It's not full explanation, and there are plenty of um, uh, idiosyncratic elements. I mean, if you are trying to explain China, you will have plenty of idiosyncratic things, any country that you want. But there, is, there are some common elements that also help to explain uh, uh, why, what, is, uh, what is happening. And um, behind all this is the sense that we tend to repeat a pattern of growth that is based too much on uh, fostering uh, debt and fostering credit, and perhaps we are not paying enough attention to uh, the other elements, productivity, growth, etc., is, is simpler. But I mean, I have put together everything, and uh, uh, but but that's the kind of uh, interrelationship that we are uh, we, that we are looking for. Okay, um, uh, I think we've been treated to a, a, a tour de force uh, this evening, stitching together a range of different uh, issues uh, with your 
distinctive and usual clarity. Um, if you would all join me again in thanking Jaime for taking time out from uh, what will be a very busy schedule while you're in London uh, to come and talk to us this evening.